<coughs> All right, we're in a little, I guess you could say, series on uh, problem passages about salvation. We, if you would, let's turn to James chapter two. We've been looking at James chapter two about uh, this is a classic passage. In fact, I got an email. I got to tell you about this last. Thursday, I got an email from a lady uh, whose kids were here on Wednesday night, and she had a complaint because the children came home and said that they learned that uh, all you have to do to get to heaven is be nice. The first time I've ever been accused of saying that. And I told people that to get to heaven, all you have to do is be nice. So. Uh, I explained to her that's not what was taught. But the reason to bring it up is she brought up uh, James chapter 2. Uh, James chapter 2 says faith without works is dead. And she had been here before and he talked to me about it and I told her that salvation was by grace through faith, not of works. She thought I was wrong. Anyway, I spent some time trying to help her to understand James chapter 2. Our Bible study helped me to get ready for that. So I'm just saying, it, James 2 comes up. If you're ever in a conversation with somebody that got a problem with, with the gospel, they're going to bring up James 2. It's just... And the other one they bring up, I think it might, they might be tied for first. James 2 and Romans 10.9. We're going to look at that in a minute. Uh, that's what I want to deal with. I've been dealing with James 2. Romans 10, 9, to, to me, those are the top two that get brought up. But there, there are others. But we're not through with James 2. There's one more, one more verse I want us to consider. It gets, it gets brought up all the time. Uh, 2, 19. Verse 19. You believe that there's one God, you do well. Even the, even the demons believe and tremble. What if, how do people use this verse? This belief is not enough that the demons can do it. Yeah. You say, all you have to do is believe. Well, even the demons believe that. Right? How many people have heard that? Anybody ever heard somebody say that? It's very popular. It comes up all the time. It comes up, I know it comes up in Eastern Europe. Every country we went to it seemed to come up. It's all over. It's all over the world. Even the demons believe. You can't say salvation is by faith alone. So, uh, what do we need to do? What do you think uh, would be a good response if you've ever tried to respond? Jesus didn't die for demons. Okay, Jesus didn't die for demons. What do they believe? Yes. They believe. They believe yes. What? Remember, I've tried to help us to think, ask questions about the text, like uh, uh, faith without works is dead. What question did we need to ask? Faith in what? Faith for what? What's the answer? Daily life. Daily life. Okay. Uh, if a man has uh, faith but doesn't have works, can faith save him? What question do we need to ask? Saved from what? What's the answer? Unprofitable life. Saved from an unprofitable life. Okay. James isn't talking about faith for eternal life. He's not talking about salvation. <coughs> so, Russ, what question do you say we need to raise here on verse 19? That what, what do they believe? Yes. What do they believe? What? Okay, look at the verse. What do they believe? There's one God. One God. Okay. If somebody believes, will somebody get to heaven because they believe there's one God? Of course not. Of course not. I mean, believing that there's one God isn't going to get you to heaven. It's amazing how people say, well, even the demons believe. If you ever get into it, remember what Russ, what, would you, what did you just say? When you, what do they believe? What do they believe? They believe that there's one God. So are they going to get to heaven because they believe there's one God? No. Now there's other theological things like what Keith brought up. Jesus didn't die for demons and so forth. But 
here's, here's to elaborate on this, if I was talking to somebody, I would say, does that verse say that the demons believe in Jesus for eternal life? Okay, they don't, right? And they won't. <laughs> they, they, they don't and they won't believe in Jesus for eternal life. That's what you have to believe. So the demons believe something different than what we're talking about here when we talk about the saving message. This one's pretty simple, if you just remember that, in my opinion. It's just, it's, every time I brought it up to somebody, they, they, just, they, didn't, they didn't have an answer. They would say, can you guess what they would say? Well, what about this passage? In other words, they, they move off of it and go on to another one, which that's okay, at least they got off of that one. But something else here, James, so that also would help us, I think, that you got to keep referring to everybody as brethren. Yeah. They're already saved. Yeah. That's pretty clear. Yeah, 15 times. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I wanted to touch on that before we leave James 2. Any questions? Let's turn to Romans 10. Now, <clears throat> some of you. A number of you may remember that we went over Romans 10, 9. I think it was two years ago. Does anybody? You think it was two years ago? So I hate to uh, bore you if you already got this down. But I think it's good for us to see if we've got it down. For those of you that were here, now, for those of you that weren't here, this is new. But I suspect that we might need to go over it two years later and make sure we got it. Because this comes up all the time. Romans 10, 9. Um, here's what it says. It'll follow in your Bible. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, uh, you will be saved. All right, so let's see what translations we have on uh, at least the first part of the verse. If you confess, my, here's what, I have New King James, mine says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, does anybody else have a different translation? Declare, if you declare with your mouth, and in quotation marks, Jesus is Lord. Okay. Yeah, mine's similar. If you confess, oh, I lost it. If you confess with your mouth, and then quotes, Jesus is Lord. All right. Who else has a translation that might be different? Can Jesus Christ is your Lord. No. Okay. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord. Okay. Wow. That, that's interesting. <laughs> Alright. Anybody else have one that's any different? Okay. So basically two, basically two little bit different translations. Mine says, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And all the others say something like, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Right? So, with either of these translations, what's the popular interpretation? In other words, you've all, how many of you ever heard this verse? Anybody ever heard this verse? Okay. And people quote it all the time. Uh, what, what, what did they say that this means? Public profession of faith to be saved, justified. Okay, public profession of faith in order to be saved. Well, what if people will say that you have to make Christ Lord of your life? Uh, that's what they say. All right, very good, team. We've got two popular yeah. interpretations of this verse. <clears throat> What's the first one? That you have to confess Jesus with your mouth to be saved. Okay, you have to confess well, him publicly. In order to be saved, Keith, repeat yours again. You have to make Christ Lord and Master of your life yes. to be saved. Yes. And those are, uh, I'm, not, 
I'm not sure what for people to say you have to make him Lord of your life would, would all would include the first one that you have to profess him publicly. So uh, I mean there's a new there's a new subtle one I've heard recently, confession equals believing. Yeah. And that's 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 dangerous. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there is a new teaching out. Uh, that Steve and I have run across that confess equals believe. I'll just say it just that's a strange one because then you read uh, whoever believes with your mouth and believes in your heart. I mean, it's almost nonsensical. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense to me. But first of all, that Paul would say believe, believe. But how do you believe with your mouth? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So. All right, let's, let's think about this first one. If you must confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. So the question is, if this is talking about public profession, what, what, what is suggested as to what that looks like? Okay, some would say baptism. Yeah. What would, what would someone else say? Walking down, going to the front. Aisle. Yeah. Walking down the aisle. Yeah. And this is, I grew up under this when I was a kid. You must profess publicly, and the way you do that is you walk to the front of the church. And that's how you confess with your mouth. Anybody ever heard that? Okay. What, what other, Suggestions are there here. Some people would say that means that you have to say the sinner's prayer. Yeah. Probably out loud, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or with somebody. Uh, what if, what if, now, in fairness to some people uh, that would suggest it means come to the front of the church, they might say, well, you don't have to come to the front of the church. But what you do need to do is what? Raise your hand. Or raise your hand. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then the preacher says, I see that. I see that. <laughs> yeah. well, some would say, well, you don't, you don't have, you can get saved outside of church. You, and and there, there, there are people that would say, you don't have to be in church to get saved. Hopefully. Even the people that teach that would say, you don't have to be in church to get saved. So if you're not in a church service, what what would it look like to confess with your mouth? Sinner's prayer. Tell that person that told you, possibly. Yeah. On Mars. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. You've got to tell somebody. It could be the person to talk to you. Speak it out loud. Say it out loud. Yeah, say it with your mouth. Uh, go home and tell your wife. I don't know. But, but there, people, some people say it means come to the front of the church. But even they would probably say, you don't have to go to the front of the church. <coughs> one place, but you could confess. You just have to tell somebody somewhere. What's the problem with, with what, what we're talking about here? It, for those that believe this, what, what First of all, it's the mark. Yeah, context. Context. Yeah. What he's talking about. Yeah. But what's the practical problem of trying to apply it? How do you know, you know talk to the right person or told enough people or you confess the problem? Yeah, it's very yeah. good. How do you know if you talk to the right person or told enough people or where do you do this? It's very, very fuzzy. Right? It's very fuzzy as to when, what does this look like to the professor? confess with your mouth to be saved. And does that mean, okay, if you have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, at what point are you actually saved? At what point are you born again? Believing in your heart. Well, I'm talking about what they teach. Confessing after you confess. When you get through with it. Believe in, yeah. when, if you believe in your heart, uh, you're not saved. It's not until you publicly profess to someone 
whoever that is and wherever that might be. Now here's another uh, issue, a practical issue. Is this a one-time event or an ongoing event? In other words, do I confess one time and I'm done? Or do I need to keep on confessing? That's, that's an issue that people that hold this view run into. It's a very practical problem. Uh, many of them would say, well, it's a one-time event. That's kind of what I was taught. Maybe you were too. Then there's others that say, "Oh no, you got it. You got to keep confessing him daily." daily. <laughs> and that that would imply if you don't do that, you'll lose your salvation. Or you never had it. Or you never had it. Yeah, that's good. yeah. Or you never had it. So the uh, I guess you could say the common view of Romans 10:9 is a very difficult view to get a hold of. Even for those that hold it, it's very difficult to know what it looks like and when when it applies. Um, Bob? Is, um, is it fair to say that based on that passage, believe in, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that um, the disciples weren't saved because they didn't think Jesus would rise from the dead. Yeah, that's a whole other topic. Right. But if you say that what you have, yeah, you're, you're helping folks in the last part of it, what do you have to believe? We'll go there just for a moment. Um, what do you have to believe to be saved? What's the text say? That God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. And, uh, I'll try to elaborate on what you just said, because I'm not sure everybody got it. So, um, the disciples who became the apostles um, were with Jesus for three years, three and a half years, and um, they didn't ever believe that he would be crucified and, and, and be raised from the dead. So, if that that logic would, would imply those disciples were not saved then. Right. They and didn't that, have everlasting life because they didn't believe that. Yeah, and that raises questions that we'll get into later. But that's, that's a good question to raise. All right, so what we've looked at is the common view of Rome, at least the first part of Romans 10, 9, and the practical uh, issues, and problems that come with that common view. Uh, very difficult issues. So, what I want us to do now is think about, can you think of a passage that would contradict this common view? What's a passage that would contradict the common view that you must confess with your mouth in order to be saved to heaven? John 6, 47. Hold up the John. Okay, the Gospel of John. <laughs> First Timothy one sixteen. Yeah, yeah. How about uh, Acts sixteen thirty one? How about the most maybe the most famous <laughs> verse in the Bible? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him and confesses with his mouth uh, uh, shall not perish. Uh, <laughs> have it in life. In life. And verse ten. With the heart, one believes unto righteousness. Uh, but John 3.16, I like to go to John 3.16 because everybody knows it. And y'all even laughed when I quoted it that way. I mean, Jesus didn't say that, did he? <coughs> if you had to confess with your mouth to be saved, then Jesus, he messed up when he presented John 3.16. I was thinking about the second part of verse 10. Yeah, let's hold off on verse 10. We'll get to that later. I'm just trying to get us to bring up an obvious contradiction to the common view of Romans 10 9. Something's wrong with the common view of Romans 10 9 if Jesus didn't bring up confess with your mouth. Where, where did Jesus bring up that you have to confess with your mouth in order to get to heaven? Heaven. 
What, what did he always say? Believe. 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 He never said confess with your mouth. So this is a problem uh, for the common view. It's just not what Jesus thought. That might be why. That might be why someone's trying to change the definition of confess into believe. Yeah. Yeah. Why would he took at one point? In time, his Bible study he took the word "be out." Hold, hold off, hold on. Just be patient. Get to that. <laughs> I'm just trying to bring up that before we even look to try to explain what it says, we need to realize there's a contradiction to the common view. And the main contradiction is Jesus didn't teach this. Jesus didn't teach the common view. Um, I always like Acts 10. We've looked at this before, but just turn over a few pages to Acts to the left, uh, to Acts chapter 10, and we'll look at this passage again. I say again. Uh, we've looked at it before. Uh, you might not have been here when we looked at it. All right. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, Peter is speaking to unsaved people. <coughs> And he tells them about Jesus. And I want to skip to verse 44. Well, 43. To him, Jesus, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. So what happened to them in that moment? They were believed, they were saved, they were born again. And what was Peter doing when they believed? He was still preaching. He didn't get to finish his message. He didn't get to give an invitation. They just believed. And the Holy Spirit, when it says the Holy Spirit fell upon them, that confirms what? The moment of belief. They were believers. Yeah, they had eternal life. So, where in there did they confess with their mouth? They didn't. they didn't have a chance. They didn't have a chance to confess with their mouth. God saved them. When? Oh, I love this passage. It totally contradicts the common view of Romans 10, 9, 2. It totally contradicts it. Because here you have an example, an obvious example of people that did not confess with their mouth. They didn't even have a chance. They were born again the moment they believed. So let's go back to Romans 10, 9 and try to... All I've done that so far is present the common view and contradictions to the common view. Now we need to say, well, what does Romans 10, 9 mean? And it can't mean what the common view says. What does it mean? Mom? Yeah. Um, earlier... Uh, uh, you mentioned emphatically that the Bible cannot contradict itself, so we have to rearrange our thinking to understanding it where it doesn't. Well put. That's what I've tried to demonstrate. It can't mean what the common view says, because that would contradict what Jesus said, what we read in Acts, and a countless number of other scriptures. We could be here all morning and look at scriptures that contradict the common view. One of the other things is chronologically, the events and acts happened before Paul wrote Romans. Okay. So you get that event happened first. Right. So. Romans 10 9. What question do we need to ask in Romans 10 9? Saved from what? Whenever you read the word saved, you got to ask what? Saved from, Save from what? That's the key here. Now, what is the common view assuming? Saved from, Save from hell. 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 Saved from hell. Uh, people read this and say, oh, it says there about how to be saved. And the common view assumes that Paul's talking about how to be saved from hell. And if, I'll just say it, if Paul is saying that saved means saved from hell. 
then what conclusion must we come to? Well, yeah, the, the con he's contradicting Jesus. Right. Confession is necessary to salvation. That what? That confession is necessary to yeah. salvation. That, that confessing with your mouth is necessary to, to being saved from hell. This is the problem here. If if we say that confess, that saved means saved from hell, then the common view has to be right. Has to be right. <coughs> Even though it's coming... It, then you got a real problem because it contradicts Jesus. But this is the issue here. The issue here is, what does Paul mean by saved? If he means saved from hell, then you couldn't help but come up with the common view. But you got to confess with your mouth. So, we need to ask saved from what? And what other option will we have if it's not saved from National salvation. Yeah. yeah, you're on a good track. Some of you have studied Romans before with us, so turn back to chapter one of Romans, because Paul tells us uh, what the theme is of the book of Romans in chapter one, verse eighteen. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men is, is suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. So, uh, from verse 18, what do we need to be saved from? The wrath of God. And who experiences the wrath of God? All believers and non-believers. Yes, all ungodliness and unrighteousness. So who would that include, Steve? Believers and non-believers. Yeah, it would include unbelievers for sure. How about believers? Yes. Yeah. Anybody in here? Uh, you don't have to raise your hand, but anybody in here who has done acts of unrighteousness since you were born again? Wes has. <laughs> <laughs> I would think it's a true statement. So, Paul, Paul, what's significant about the word all? All. Not That means all. Believers and unbelievers. If, you, if you're a born again Christian, you have eternal life, and you sin. And you you won't admit it, or you just keep on in, in a sin. What are you going to experience? God's wrath. wrath of God. The wrath of God. Where? Right here. 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 When you die? No. No. Right. no right now. Because what if, what in the verse tells you that it's right now? Thank you. Is that little word is? wrath of God is revealed. It doesn't say will be revealed. What what would some people think that the wrath of, would be when the time judgment, when somebody judgment, judgment. Yeah, and the eternal after you die. If you you'll experience the wrath of God after you die. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying it's right now in this life. If you if you're a Christian and you sin and you don't Turn from it. How does God feel about you? Based on this word. You're out of fellowship. <laughs> What's wrath mean, by the way? This anger. 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 Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Is God angry with you when you sin? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you have a child, if you, those of you that are fathers, were, were you ever angry with your child? <laughs> okay. Does that mean that you didn't love them? No. 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 Does that mean that you kicked them out of the family? That you disowned them? No. You consumed them too. <laughs> uh, God get, is angry with children that persist in sin. Just like you as a father were angry. Now, what's the difference between your anger and God's anger? 
It's perfect. His is perfect, and, and mine's not. It's not wrong to be angry, but it can be if you if you don't handle it correctly. God's anger is never out of line. It's always perfect. The point is. I'm belaboring. Is God angry with unbelievers who sin? Yes. Is He angry with believers who sin? Yes. So God's wrath is revealed against all of God's unrighteousness of men. What's it? What would it look like to be under God's wrath? Having problems. <laughs> yeah. Problem after problem after problem. Yeah. He'll He'll hand you over to the consequences of your sin, and you get deeper into these difficulties and problems that you feel guilty and we've all been through this about when we've got sin in our lives and we don't get it right with God it's a miserable life and we need to be saved from God's wrath so before we look at how, what would it look like to, how what would it look like to be saved from God's wrath what would have to happen Right, yes. Yeah. 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 And 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 turn from sin and walk with God. Now Paul alluded, well, this is what the whole book of Romans is about. The whole book of Romans is about how to be saved from the wrath of God. That's that's the that's what Romans is about. What's the from my believer, what's he got it? What's he got to do to be? What's he got to do to be saved from wrath? That's to believe first. First, he has to believe in Jesus. First, he has to get eternal life. And hopefully, you've already done that. So now you have the potential to do the second thing: to be saved from wrath. And uh, Paul alludes to that. That's what he talks about. <clears throat> What Paul does in Romans, he talks first about being justified before God. Then he talks about how to be saved from wrath in your daily life. Turn over to chapter 7. And I just want to get a highlight here of what Paul is trying to teach us in the book of Romans. Romans uh, chapter 7, verse 15. What I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Okay. Now, is Paul writing as an unbeliever or a believer? Yeah, he's a believer. Even Paul said, I struggle with sin. And everybody in this room could have written verse 15. You know, uh, what I know I should do, I don't do. And what I uh, shouldn't do, what I hate, that I do. All of you can relate to that, can you? I just shouldn't have said that, but I did it. Or I should say that, but I don't. So, now, with that... Highlight, look at verse 24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Is he talk is he talking about eternal how to, that he needs eternal life? No, he's talking about sin. Yeah. He's talking about being delivered from sin in his daily life. How can I Quit sinning. How can I live victoriously? Hey, Bob, does that deliver me the same word that's used for saved in Romans 10 9? I think it's a synonym. Well, let me look. That's a good question. Uh, 724. Uh, well, it says rescue now. Yeah, it's a different, it's a synonym for save, deliver. Yeah, good question. All right? So, the book of Romans is written uh, to tell us how to be delivered from wrath. 
First, you have to be justified. Next, uh, he tells us through Romans how to be delivered and how to be saved from the daily power of sin in your life. So when we go to chapter 10, and we have that background, it, it, it puts a whole different light on Romans 10.9. Look at 10.9 again. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God is raising from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Right. Saved from wrath. I'm not talking about being saved from hell. So Romans 10.9 is not written to tell you how to get to, to heaven. It's written to tell you how to have victory in your daily life. And to get victory in your daily life, you have to do two things. You have to confess and believe. Now we need to ask, confess what? To whom? To Jesus. Uh -huh. So in 7.24, he's asking to be delivered from his dying body, specifically. His dead body, not dying body. Okay. His dead body. All right. My version says dying body. Well, that's a bad translation. <laughs> I'm not arguing with you. I'm saying that's why I said dying. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Greg brought it up. This yeah. is what translators do. He Paul didn't say my dying body. He said my dead body. Okay, so what, dead what, body. What would he mean by my... He's alive, but he said my body's dead. What's spiritually dead. Yeah, spiritually dead. What James was talking about. Your, your body and my body is fleshly. It's not spiritual. But where where is where where what part of you is spiritual? Inner man. Your inner man. Paul uses that term. The Holy Spirit lives inside of your body, right? Okay. So what Paul's point is, if I if I try to make my body say and do things that it should do, I I see if it's saying I try harder, that'll do it. I'll just try harder. Is that going to work? No. What do we need? Yeah, we need our help. We need to let the Holy Spirit work through our body. And in that sense, the Holy Spirit gives life to our body. The, the life of God expressed in your tongue, in your what you do with your hands. That's what he means. Life to my dead body. Yeah, so asking for to be saved from the, his dead body in 7. And in 10, Paul's saying that a person can be saved from what? Wrath. Right. Right. Those it, are two different things, right? But the dead body leads to the wrath? or how those? Two different ways of looking at the exact same thing. Okay. In other words, uh, my dead body keeps sinning, which brings me under the wrath of God. So I need to be saved from my dead body so I can be saved from God's wrath. Okay, if somebody's going to ask that, if they're thinking, they're going to say, well, you're saying saved from what? So let's really get down to what are we being saved from in each of these verses? Yeah. And they're two, diff they're two separate things, but they're related in the way that you just explained. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Now I know why we took the uh, in our past yeah, experiences. I know now. Thank, hold that thought. Now, to be saved from wrath in your daily life, first thing he mentions is you have to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Now, the question that we have to ask is confess what and to whom? Because if you confess something with your mouth, that means you're saying something to somebody, right? saying something to somebody. So uh, we need to think, now, we're, now we have to deal with the translation issue. And this is always, always makes me uncomfortable when I say we have a translation problem. Because we're at the mercy, in our, with our English Bibles, we're at the mercy of the translator, right? And I've said this many times, the translations are good and most of the time, they're not, it's not a problem. But this is one time where the translation, the English translations, 
will keep us from understanding what Paul wrote. Because when we started, I asked, what translations do you have? And including my New King James, all of these translations are wrong. And I'm sorry, but that's true. And I'll tell you uh, why. My translation says, confess with your mouth. No, I want to start with the other translations first. The other, my, mine says, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. But all the other translations says, said, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Or something like that. Am I correct? Yes. <laughs> Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. What was yours, Matt? Lord, your life. <laughs> yeah, that's really stretching it. <laughs> Confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord of your life. None of those translations are correct. And I'll tell you a couple of reasons why. First of all, the word order. Uh, the word order is Lord Jesus. All the manuscripts, every Greek manuscript, has Lord Jesus, not Jesus Lord. Okay? Keep that thought in mind. Word order. The word order is in all, in, uh, in those translations, shifts the word order. That shifts the word order. Instead of saying Lord Jesus, it says Jesus Lord. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus Lord. Lord. By the way, if you're a translator, that doesn't make sense in English. Confess with your mouth, Jesus, Lord. So what do you have to supply? Is or as. Is or as. You have to put the word is in there. Confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Or confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord. So when the translator shifted the word order, he had an added word that's not even in the in the text. So he did two things that weren't right. He shifted the word order and he stuck another word in there that's not in the text. So I'm looking at the literal version, the L A D P and the word uh, is in uh, word, uh, a light gray saying that article isn't there. Yeah, now we're into the new King James and maybe the King James. Yeah. Who has a King James? Does the King James say, uh, the Lord Jesus? Okay, so the King James, the New King James say, the Lord Jesus. So, the King James, the New King James got the word order right. Okay, give them a star. Got the right word order. Confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus. What did you find in... You, you're, you're ahead of me, but go ahead. Yeah, the literal version puts the as, as a light gray, meaning the article the in the Greek is not there. Thank you. So what the New King James people did, and the King James people, they got the word order right, but they stuck the word T-H-E T -H -E in there. The Lord Jesus. It's not there. And uh, to give credit to your literal translation, it puts it in gray to show that that's not really in the text, and it's not. So, with what I told you, let's, let's come back to what is actually in the text. First of all, Lord Jesus. Second of all, the word the is not there. So literally, what it says... If you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus. Now, I'm going to repeat that two more times to make sure we all heard it. If you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus. If you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus. Using the two words as a title. Who am I talking to if I confess with my mouth, Lord Jesus? Jesus. I'm talking to Jesus. That's the only way that I can read it that it makes sense. I'm confessing with my mouth, Lord Jesus. <coughs> now to be saved from wrath, why do I need to confess? Why do I need to say to Jesus, Lord Jesus? I need his help. I need your help. 
if I want to be saved from the power of sin in my daily life, whose help do I need? Jesus. Jesus. I need Jesus. And to be saved from the power of sin, the wrath of God, I need to call out to Jesus. I need to call out to Jesus. That's what Paul's saying. Just like he did in 724, O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Yeah, and I didn't keep reading. <clears throat> Thank God through Jesus Christ. That's what he says here. So guys, this is such a great verse for your Christian life. If you're struggling with sin, who do you need to cry out to? Jesus. Jesus. That's what Paul's saying. If you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, you're calling out to Jesus. And by the way, that's what he says. I'm going to skip ahead right now down to uh, verse 13. <clears throat> For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Right? Right. Right. What do you need to do to be saved from daily wrath? Verse 13. Call on his name. Call on him. Is that true? Do you need to call on Jesus to save you from sin in your daily life? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> that verse 13 goes hand in hand with what we read in uh, verse 9. By the way, what's the common view of verse 13? Whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. From hell. Saved from hell. Yeah. Uh, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about how to be saved from the power of sin. You need to call on. You need to call out to Jesus. You need to call out the name of the Lord. You need to do that every day. Jesus, help me. <laughs> I'm calling on you, Lord Jesus. I need your help. I think Bob doesn't the word Lord in the word Christ give the the name Jesus his his. his defines him as Lord or as Christ. Well, Jesus was the name that was given to him as a human, the word of Jesus, the name Jesus. But when you, when you use the word Lord or Christ, you are in fact acknowledging Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ that he is the Almighty. Yeah. yeah. If you're calling on him personally, you're recognizing that you want him to be Lord of your life, and that's why you're calling on him. That you don't you want him to have control of your life. I mean, he knows in my heart when I say Jesus help me that in any given situation, I hope he knows I'm saying Lord Jesus or Jesus Christ, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, Paul put the word "Lord" in there, so we need to consider why, why do we say why do we why did he tell us to say to call out Lord Jesus instead of just Jesus? That's a good point, and I think it to me uh, it would imply that I, I want you to be Lord of my life and call it out to you for help because I want you to have your way in my life as as my Lord. Can. These are discussions some of these people who point out what the great word is in chapter 10, the present. So he says, I don't believe it. He's not talking yeah. to you. Uh, Ken's got a real good point. Did you hear it? Verse 1. What's the first word? Brethren. He's not talking to people about how to be saved from hell. He's talking to Christians about how to be saved from wrath. To do that, you have to call out to Jesus. That's all he's saying. If you confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus. And then he says, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. We'll get into that in a moment, or maybe next week. I don't know. Bobby well, further solidifies it and hammers it in the context of 14 and 15. He says, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach unless someone, unless they are sent? So one has to be sent, someone has to preach, they have to hear, they have to believe. Believe always precedes calling, so they have to call. It's right there in the immediate text. Yeah, I was getting there, but I'm glad you did. 
calling on the name of the Lord is after you believe. In, in the order that Paul has it here. All right, now, the second part of verse 9 says, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. It's not enough just to call on him. You also need to believe that God raised him from the dead. Now, why would he say that? We'll get into that next uh, week. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, I thank you for uh, your word. Certainly this verse is such a powerful verse for us as Christians. Thank you for reminding us how much we need you in our daily life. And as great as the verse is to help us, it's the verse that has confused countless numbers of people. And I pray that you would help us to help them to see that to have eternal life, they just simply need to believe in Jesus for it. Use us to help others. Amen.